the string section of the symphony orchestra is, for the vast majority of repertoire, the bedrock of the orchestral sound and, collectively, its leading voice. Like the wind and brass sections, it has instruments that span the entire range of notes, from the lowest in the double basses to the highest in the violins. There was no standard number of players in the string section in the 18th century. A provincial court might have as few as 12 or 15, but a major music-making centre like Mannheim might have 40 or more. This expansion continued throughout the 19th century due to many reasons from the size of concert halls to the requirements of individual composers. Hector Berlioz regularly asked for 60 players or more to combat the larger and larger wind, brass and percussion sections he required. Berlioz's compatriot, Claude Debussy, recognising the string's unique ability to blend and create wonderful colours en masse, told one theatre manager that he didn't want lots of violins to play loudly, but he needed them to create the right kind of hushed pianissimo. He also took advantage of this increased set of numbers to divide the section into more than five parts. The strings sit at the front of the orchestra, and each music stand is shared by two players, a desk in orchestral terms. Each section of the strings, first violins, second violins, violas, cellos and basses, are led by a principal player. The principal violins, viola and cello, sit in a tight formation at the front, with the basses often just behind the cellos. These players can then see and hear each other clearly, something as important, arguably more important, to the ensemble and sound of the orchestra than the ability to see the conductor. The most important of these is the first violin, who is not only the principal of the violins, but the leader of the entire orchestra. The leader of the orchestra often sets the precise moment where the orchestra's sound will start, taking their cue from the conductor. His or her movement will project to the other players, giving a clear visual cue. When leading the orchestra and leading an entry of the whole orchestra, it's very important that the gesture of the lead match the gesture of the entry. For instance, with a fortissimo chord with an accent on it, the gesture needs as much vigour and intensity as the note to be played. So for a fortissimo chord, you'd need a fortissimo lead. <laughs> And conversely, if the note to be played is pianissimo and with a, a soft lyrical sound, then the gesture also needs to be similarly gentle. In the music of the late classical era, the music of Mozart and Haydn, a typical texture has the first violins playing the melody and all the other parts providing rhythmic accompaniment and harmonic support. In fact, the cellos and basses often play from the same part, separated only by the octave difference in their instruments. To get that blend of sound and uniformity of music making, the use of the bow is incredibly important. This is set by the leader in conjunction with the other principals as well as the conductor. When playing music from the classical era, we need to adopt a more classical style. This involves both uh, changes in the way we use the bow and also the way we use uh, the vibrato in the left hand. In the classical period, the bows were very different to our modern bow. They were shaped more like an archer's bow. And so they produced a lot more articulation and also a lot more release in the sound. In romantic era playing, we're often taught that we should be trying to sustain the sound throughout the bow, hide the bow changes and make a continuous vibrato. 
but in classical era music, players are trying to speak and to dance using the bow rather than trying to just make a continuous singing sound. And the left hand, as opposed to being a continuous vibrato, is used to just colour the end of notes or as an expressive device. For the lower parts, their sense of common purpose is also led by the bow. And here, it's about where in the bow they play rather than which direction it's moving in or how much of it they use. In the Mozart, the cellos and basses are accompanying the violin with quavers. Now the quavers should be the rhythm, they're basically the rhythm of the piece, so it's like the rhythm section. And to play them, you should be very light. We should be playing them around about here in the bow. The oral and visual communication runs from player to player as well as through the conductor. The principals all have good eye contact with each other and every section player is aware of their principal at all times. String instruments have a great advantage, of course, in that you can see with their bows exactly where the sound's about to start. As the classical period gives way to the romantic period and we move into the 19th century, that first violin-centric view of the world starts to change. Here's the opening of the allegro of the first movement of Beethoven's second symphony. Beethoven gives the melody at this really important moment to the violas, cellos and basses. The violins now have the accompaniment and the occasional commentary. <laughs> in the Beethoven, it's very important to bring out the articulation so it carries across the orchestra so that everyone can hear it. And it's around this time that the cellos and basses become more independent of each other. The bass is taking charge for the foundation of the sound and the cello is being used more often for expressive melodies. Even when we're not playing in unison with the cellos or in octaves, as was mentioned before, it's still important to maintain some kind of visual contact with the cello section and with the principal cello, so that we can accompany them, as is in the case in this Schubert. When they're playing the melody, we can fit our pizzicatos in with them perfectly. And the cello is the perfect instrument to play this beautiful melody, and while we're playing it, to be very aware of sustaining a long line and keeping it alive with a nice vibrato. Just as we make many different attacks with the bow, so we can make many different attacks when playing pizzicato. I think when accompanying a melody in Schubert, you want to th really think about the type of sound that you make. One that is quite broad and not too harsh in attack. And to do this, you want to use as many fingers as possible and as much flesh. If you pluck the string too much with the end of the finger, it's quite hard. But if you use different fingers and more flesh and use a rolling motion across like this, the sound naturally is 
more resonant. And I think that's probably more appropriate for what we need in this passage. The violins also have this beautiful melody in the Schubert. We have it in octaves. The second violin line helps support the first violin. If we play a little louder, a little stronger, and if we keep our vibrato a little narrower so that it doesn't alter the intonation, I think that really helps. And when the first violins have that support from the second violin bottom octave, it enables us to balance on top of that and create a beautiful blended sound. Later, romantic composers heard beauty in using violins, violas and cellos to play melodies in octaves. Here's Debussy again. In the melody in Debussy, it's quite important to make a, a more veiled sound and with, with a very intense vibrato throughout the section, so it blends nicely with the violins in this melody. And here's Tchaikovsky at the other end of the emotional scale. <laughs> This Tchaikovsky excerpt we just played calls for the highest emotional intensity at a triple forte, quadruple forte dynamic. In order to achieve this, we need to use a bow quite close to the bridge, quite a slow bow speed and quite a lot of bow pressure. Our vibrato needs to be wider to absorb the intensity of the bow. Using a wide, intense vibrato also helps project the sound and the emotional intensity of the excerpt. Just at the end there, we could see the whole section pick up their bows and head back to the point nearest their hand, the heel of the bow. This is an instruction made by the composer and there is a ferocity and concentration to be had at this part of the bow that's simply not replicable elsewhere. It's thrilling at speed too. 
Here's Rimsky Korsakov in his piece Scheherazade. <laughs> In this section, we can run into two main problems. The first is that by trying to play three note chords on down bows, that we lose tempo and we get behind the other sections. If we listen closely to the semiquavers of the second violins while we're playing, then that can avoid this problem. Secondly, the sound can often become very scratchy when we try to, to play chords so quickly. So if we focus on um, keeping the right hand very flexible in the, in the small muscles of the hand and in the wrist, and not making too big a movement when we play the chords, then that will help achieve the beauty of sound. And now we can hear similar music, but played at the other end of the bow, the point, and with the added frisson of a delicate tremolo. It's sometimes a struggle to achieve the right colour, the shimmer that we need in a tremolando. So when we're playing at the tip of the bow, I think really trying to make sure our right shoulder is relaxed, tilting the bow hair as much as possible, using less bow hair on the string and making the movement come from the wrist and the fingers and never the arms and really, really relaxing the right shoulder means you can tremolo much longer without tension. An alternative sound that's often used for string sections is for the players to play pizzicato, plucking the string with their fingers. Again, great orchestras rely on the communication from the leader to the principals as much as they do from the conductor. In the Rossini piece, when the entire string section are playing pizzicato chords together, it's again important to think about the type of sound that you make, but also to maintain contact with the other principal players, particularly the leader, so that we can all play together. Pizzicato can be played faster too. Here's Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony. In fact, it's so fast the players elect to put their bows down to leave their hands free. Modern symphony orchestra has typically 60 strings, 16 firsts, 14 seconds, 12 violas, 10 cellos and 8 basses. But despite this enormous size, they combine immersive listening and alert watching to make a wonderful array of colours and sounds. <laughs> 